That's right. It's like I, I need to go to a breakout room because got to pull these hamburgers off. That's the. <laughs> Hey, everybody. Welcome to another edition of The Mo Show Live, everybody. I'm Morris Lillianthal. All right. So if you're watching the news right now, there's three things in the news. There's the election, the U.S. Supreme Court, and if you're in Alabama, Nick Saban has COVID. And so, and I'm, you know, I don't know if you're from Alabama, what the most important topic is right now. I think it's pretty obvious. I could not get Nick Saban on, so we're going to have to go with topic two and talk about uh, the U.S. Supreme Court and the nomination of Judge Amy Coney Barrett to uh, the court. But what I really wanted to talk about, and I don't think is being really touched on in the media a lot, is what is the role of the court? There's there's a lot of yammering back and forth on the left and the right about, you know, should you, we be pushing somebody through this close to an ex election? Should the Senate be doing this? Is this proper for the president? And do, but I don't think a lot of people have a real true understanding of what types of cases the court hears how a judge becomes a federal judge to start with and then maybe moves up to become a court of appeals and then even here to the highest court in the land, New York Supreme Court. So to talk to me about that, I've got my good friends, Alicia Kinslow and Ryan Lott. Uh, these are great attorneys uh, that I have gotten the pleasure to know over the years and I brought them on to talk to us about this. So let me do a quick introduction. Alicia is the founder of the Kinslow Law Firm in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. She focuses on family law and business law and probably a few do other things here and there and is also a business owner as well of a salon and our uh, other guest today is Ryan Locke out of Atlanta, Georgia. Ryan owns is the founder of the Locke Law Firm and focuses on representing personal injury victims and handling criminal appeal. So guys, thank y'all so much for taking time to join us today. How are you guys doing? You guys been following the Supreme Court nomination? Um, I'm doing well. Thank you so much for having me. It's always good to chat with you and Ryan. Um, about topics like this and, and other things too, just for fun. But um, kind of cursory, I would have to say, you know, it, it's kind of been in the background of so many other things going on. You got virtual schooling going on and we're, all of us are law firm owners. So we're, you know, keeping our eyes on the ball there. But it's a very important thing to kind of make sure that we are paying attention to. We need to know what's going to happen, what the makeup of our courts may look like. And of course, it's kind of hard to, I think, not pay some attention to it because it is kind of everywhere right now. Yeah, Ryan, what about you? Is this something that you, you're kind of in tuned in? And I know you do, uh, part of your practice is doing a fair amount of appellate work. And, and so, you know, kind of talk to us a little bit about how you're kind of tuning into this. Uh, well, it's, um, first, thanks for having me, Mo. It's always good to see you, Alicia. Um, I, I'm kind of at the same level of awareness where I'm, I'm following it a bit, but not too closely. And, and I think really a lot of people are like that because the, you know, the Senate is supposed to give advice and consent to the president when he picks a nominee to the Supreme Court, but there's been a real modern trend of um, you know, you know, people being nominated, not really showing their cards about um, what they think about major issues. And um, you know, I, I think to really figure out you know, what a person is going to be like on the Supreme Court, if, if they're a, a circuit court of appeals judge, then you look at their opinions. If they're a district court judge, you look at their opinion. You, you kind of have to comb through what they've already done to suss out, you know, how are how are they going to act once once they're on the court. And so, um, so I'm I'm kind of I'm kind of more interested in in the decisions that she's already made than than necessarily the um, uh, the the circus in Washington. Well, that brings up a good point and, and a, something I wanted to talk about, and we can talk about it now, and that is you know, the requirements to be a U.S. Supreme Court justice, to be a federal district court judge, as I understand, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Ryan and Alicia, but if you know any different, other than, I didn't know, think uh, that law clerk that I had to do some research on this, I don't even think you have a law, have to have a, technically have to have a law degree to be on the U.S. Supreme Court. Because, um, you know, years and years ago, the, for example, the founder of our law firm in 1937 never went to law school. He read for the law and took the bar. And I know that's not commonplace and anymore, but to say that I don't believe there's any age limits, old or young, to be on the U.S. Supreme Court. And more importantly, to your point, Ryan, I don't know of any limits of time that they have had to serve as either a trial judge or as a judge on the federal district court or criminal court of appeals. And I think what we see, and maybe one of the, the you know the complaints about Judge Barrett, uh, Barrett is that she doesn't have a lot of time on the bench or a lot of the time as a practicing lawyer. What do you guys think about that? Should there be a minimum of that to, to give a basis for us to know 
what kind of judge we may be nominating? Alicia, what do you think? So I think that it definitely is, I mean, we know it's strategic, right? You know, if these are lifetime appointments, if we are appointing people who are fairly young, you get the, the power of whatever decision making that they're gonna have for a lot longer. So I think that definitely is a reason to go there. Then you also have a situation where they're not tainted too much by their decisions, right? You don't have a whole lot of things that you can kind of look to, to kind of say how they may or may not rule. And you're going by what you believe that they're going to do. And I think that's a lot of what we're seeing with um, the current nominee is that we have her kind of being somewhat outspoken in some ways about her religious beliefs. And people are using that to believe that she's going to rule a certain way. We also did that's not the case all the time. People can be able to separate what they believe in terms of the religious beliefs or personal beliefs and be able to make decisions on how they believe that decision should be reviewed. But I do think that there are some benefits to having, um, there are benefits to having no um, age limit on there. There are benefits to having no term limits on there. The idea is that you, you're not easily swayed. Um, if you're not worried about being reelected or um, leaving at a certain president's term, you don't have to worry about as much about the decisions you're making. But then, you know, the other part is you have somebody on there who just sits there and may not ask a question in 10 years, you know, you know, every once in a while that might happen. So um, yeah, there's some benefits and there's some, there's some problems with it as well. Yeah, there's pros and cons both ways. Ryan, what, what do you think? I mean, should there be, you know, Alicia makes some good points that by having someone who may not have the track record, it may be easier to, if you're, you know, the president, or a certain political party trying to confirm that nomination, it may be easier to get that person pushed through. Yeah, you know, I think it certainly makes it politically more palatable if there's, um, you know, if, if you're less able to read a nominee's tea leaf. Um, you know, I think it's a, it, it's kind of a fun lawyer parlor game to say, well, how, how would you design the Supreme Court if it were up to you, you know, in the year 2020? And you know, I think we all have our ideas about, about things we would change. The, the, I think things that are important in, in the Supreme Court that, that uh, probably should be maximized. One is, I think, diversity. Um, and not just diversity of, um, you know, diversity of, of race and sex and age, but I also think diversity of education. So right now we have Supreme Court justices who have all gone to Ivy League schools, right? Um, or at least the majority of them have. And so it, it's it's notable that that Judge Coney Barrett graduated from Notre Dame. Um, the other thing I think is geographic diversity, because when when the Supreme Court's making a decision, it you know it decides what the law is for the entire nation. And so wh when it's making a decision, it's deciding for people sitting in Boston for people sitting in Provo. And the, um, I would like to see a greater geographic diversity of, of Supreme Court justices from our, our, the various regions of our country because you know how life is on the ground is, is, is very different for me here in Georgia than it may be for someone in Southern California than for someone up in Oregon. That's a great point. I, to be frank, I have not thought about that. But but you, you think about that in terms of the way the Congress is made up. We have representatives that are voting on bills and things uh, from all over the country. And there's no doubt when you look at the map and certainly look at it from a political standpoint, that the, the red and blue, that there's different viewpoints. And a lot of times it's based upon, you know, region of the country. And I think having that that diversity on the court would be would be something to look at. And so here, uh, you know, and there's been some talk in the news cycle about, quote, packing the court. But I think right now what we've got is we have nine justices on the Supreme Court. And if I did my research right, I think there were originally six. It's gone to five and shifted around. But, but in modern history, it's always been nine justices. And so, you know, uh, everybody's kind of look at it from, you know, a standpoint of what is someone's leanings to know who's going to have the the majority viewpoint there in a five to four type of, of situation so let's let's take let's take a step back though so let's talk a little bit about what what the role of the court is and did and i think you know one of the thing I, I see in my legal practice is is you know primarily i practice in state court 
but I do have some cases over the years in federal court and I've even uh, handled appeals up to the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals. But I think a lot of people, and I, I wonder if you, you guys have experienced this over your years of practice, they don't really have an understanding of the difference between the jurisdiction of a state court and a federal court, and certainly even the U.S. Supreme Court. So why don't we take a minute and just break that down for our audience of, of what types of things would you typically see in a state court? What types of cases would you typically hear in a federal court? And then we'll work our way up to the Supreme Court. Um, Alicia, what, what do you kind of, can you kind of give us kind of a, a, a one-on-one of, of what we might expect to see and people can have, people can understand that? So I can speak to a little bit, but again, because Ryan does a lot more appellate work, he's probably <laughs> able to speak to it. But um, in, my, in my history, I've done both Social Security Administration law and a lot of family law. And so Social Security Administration is, again, it's an administrative law um, with administrative law judges who kind of fall under the federal law. If you um, are going through, let's say you file a disability claim, you go through the state for your adjudication process. And then if you're denied by the state, then you turn around and you go to an administrative law judge. And then from there, if you don't, if you kind of go through all the administrative processes there, you can file a civil action in federal court. So for us, that's the Eastern District and the 13th, the Third Circuit, excuse me, in Pennsylvania. So that's an example of kind of starting an administrative law and going through the process that way. Um, then in state courts and family law, we have our trial courts. And for example, in Philadelphia, um, someone may file for custody and go to a trial court in um, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And if they are not happy with that decision, their next step is to file an appeal to the Superior Court. And then if they're not happy there and they have reason to move up, they'll go to the Supreme Court. So that's kind of an example of what that people might be able to kind of, you know, picture in their heads how their right. case might flow. Um, but I'll turn it over to Ryan to kind of explain a little bit more about um, federal courts. Yeah, you know, so so the relationship between between the different levels of courts, and it's similar at, at a state level and the federal level. There's a trial court, there's an intermediary appellate court, and then there's a Supreme Court. And in in trial courts, the usually the the question is, what are the facts, right? And a lot of times, you know, I may say that this other guy ran a red light and and t-boned me. And then he may have a witness who comes in and says, no, his light was green. And so he had the right away. And we, we have to go to a trial court and present all this evidence to a jury and a jury decides what happened, right? And a jury has to weigh witness credibility and that kind of thing. Well, if I lose at trial, then I can appeal it to an intermediary appellate court, right? The court of appeals. And intermediary appellate courts are really error correcting courts where they're looking at what happened in the trial court and is that there an error that um, affected the result that changed the trial from fair to unfair or an error that, that so infected the process that we can't trust the result, right? Maybe I say, look, you know, we had a great trial, but half the jury was asleep the entire time. And then the court of appeals would say, well, that's a problem because then we can't rely on their decision. So we're gonna send it back for another trial. The difference with the Supreme Court, and this is particularly apparent with the United States Supreme Court, is that the United States Supreme Court is not an error correcting court. So if I lose in the, in the Court of Appeals, and then I say, I, I think I lost because they should have applied, you know, the, the, you know, they said, well, one ju juror asleep is enough or something. And I say, no, I think that's wrong. And, and I say, you know, look, Supreme Court, or they, they believed one witness over another. And I say, hey, I think that's wrong. Supreme Court reversed. The Supreme Court won't really be interested in that because they're not concerned. They don't have the time to sift through the, you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of cases per year and say, oh, the result in this one was wrong. The result in this one was wrong. What they're concerned about is answering important questions about law and making the law consistent across our circuit. So the, the United States is broken into judicial circuits. Uh, both Mo and I are in the 11th circuit, which is in the Southeast. And um, there's a circuit court of appeals for each circuit. So what may happen is there may be a question of law and the 11th circuit answers yes. But then the ninth circuit out in California answers no. And so then what's the rule? Well, if you're here in the 11th circuit, the rule is yes. If you're out in California, the rule is no. 
And so that, that's a problem because we want a uniformity of law across the United States, particularly for um, entities that may have to deal with every state, right? It may be a question of do you collect tax? And so Amazon may say, this is a nightmare because now we have to track all these different circuits to see what the answer is. And, and we just want uniformity. And that's where the United States Supreme Court would, would you know, that's a case that, that would be worth the United States Supreme Court taking and then deciding and saying, this is what the law is. The law for the entire nation is no. And then, and then that's the final word on it. That's a great explanation. And um, it really was. And, you know, for most people, you're, you're like you said, to kind of boil that down, anybody that has an issue, 95, 99.9% .9 of the time, it's not going to be something that's ever going to get to the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, it's probably going to stop at the uh, either state Supreme Court or appellate courts, intermediate appellate courts. And there are things, you know, certain cases that would, you know, you would have grounds, certain issues that would be in state court more likely than in the in federal court. I know the basic jurisdiction, you know, in the kind of cases that I handle, you know, Ryan, and, and you do some of this work is, you know, if we have a, a diverse plaintiff and defendant from two different states. So if we had an accident in Alabama, but the, the at fault driver was from Georgia and the amount in controversy of my, my claiming is more than 75,000 in controversy, then that would be in, in federal court. But again, the, the laws that you and premises you discussed were, were the same, which is, hey, if it's not a legal issue that's gonna predominate everything and not just that case specific issue, it's not gonna be an issue for the US Supreme Court. You know, things that we're looking at are disputes between states, maybe things that we're looking at their constitutionality of laws, you know, maybe some election laws that we may hear some things about going out and, and, and you know, absentee voting and things like that, whether you can allow curbside voting or certain things like that, that might apply in one state that wouldn't apply in another state. And that might, you know, be something that somebody might bring up to the, to the U.S. Supreme Court. Interesting point you made too was, uh, some of the numbers that we looked at for today's show was over 7,000 cases are asked to be heard each year by the U.S. Supreme Court and only about 100 to 150 are actually heard. That's a lot, and, and, and but that's a lot for them to review and do. And many of those cases don't even get oral argument, right? Um, kind of talk to us a little bit about what that is. I don't know if people see that or hear about that, uh, guys, but what is oral argument? And I know you've done a lot of that, Ryan. Uh, in terms of an appellate court, what, what is that? What does it mean when you have an oral argument on a case? So when you're in an appellate court, um, m most of the work is done in, in writing. And so the appellate court will ask each side to submit a brief, which, which is, is really just a, you know, essentially a letter to the court. Uh, you know, it's more formalistic than that, but it, it's essentially, hey, court, we want you to decide our way and here's why. And then the other side will say, hey, we think you should decide our way and here's why. And then if oral argument is granted, then you go to the court and the court asks you questions and you answer them. And um, a really, a really, if you're interested in this, a really great resource is oye.com. It's spelled O-Y-E-Z. And it's what the marshal of the court calls out before in, in the US Supreme Court before the court uh, starts every session. And it has audio recordings of Supreme Court oral arguments back, I, I don't know how long, but, um, but it's fascinating to listen to it because it is a conversation between the bench and the lawyers about the case and, and typically about what the law, what law should apply, what facts are relevant for this part of the law, what the law should be, especially in the United States Supreme Court, there's a lot of talk about um, you know, when a case gets to the Supreme Court, um, it's almost always the situation where either party could be right. And that's a really interesting situation because then you have to think, well, wh which party should be right in, in, in looking at the law and interpreting it and thinking about um, policy perspectives, depending on your judicial philosophy. Um, and, and so oral argument is really just a conversation between the, the lawyers and the judges to try to understand the case better. And then after oral argument, the judges will, will make a decision and they'll pass memos around to each other about uh, what they think the, the result should be. And when one side has enough votes, then, then they write an opinion and issue it. 
I think something that would be important for, for lay people to understand is, 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 is what precedent is and, and how that applies. And this, you know, certainly applies in our, our state court practices from the intermediate appellate court to the state courts and certainly the U.S. Supreme Court. But Alicia, can you kind of tell people out there, because this is what's, what, what is really so important, it's not only just the ruling, but how that sets a precedent going forward for how other laws are enacted or how other cases may be decided by the lower courts, state and federal, if we're talking about the U.S. Supreme Court decisions, talk to people, you know, we all understand, hey, hey but, you know, we tell our law clerks or we're doing research on an issue, it's like, hey, find me some precedent on this, go find me a case that, that says I can do this or my client can do this and why they're wrong. But talk to us a little bit about what that is, at least just so people understand what that is. So I think precedent, I think in our, our daily lives, you kind of think about it, you know, kind of almost the way that it is, is that you're kind of setting up the stage for what is to be expected. And I think it goes to the uniformity um, that Ryan was speaking to, people understanding how the law is to be applied in certain situations. And when we speak about precedent, we're speaking, usually we're thinking about the facts of a case and the facts of another case being similar and at the outcome being similar. And so when we look at a case and there's been a decision on a case um, that creates can create a precedent. Um, there are decisions that judges that uh, courts make all the time that are considered non-presidential decisions. And sometimes courts will be specific and say that. Um, these types of decisions are given different amounts of weight. So it's important for people to understand that just because a case has been decided, sometimes court will be, courts will be specific in saying that this is a non-presidential uh, decision, which means that you should not rely on it in the next set of facts uh, that might come across the court. But we all know as lawyers, it can still be used in some ways if it's directly on point. So it's like, you can kind of use it, but not really. Um, and I know that in Pennsylvania, in our state courts, we started using more non-presidential opinions. They're given a little bit more weight than they were given before the beginning of 2019. The Supreme Court deals with mostly, we're dealing with presidential op op um, op opinions at that point. We're looking at, again, continuity of cases, continuity of facts, continuity of the way that the laws come out. So really you're looking to see, you know, how are we going to decide this case across the land? Yeah. I hope that, that explains a little bit. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's that's yeah. it. It's just laying a foundation for what 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 we as lawyers and what our clients can expect under certain circumstances. Although you know where our role really comes in as lawyers often is is we make that distinction in the facts to say this yeah. distinction is here, so this precedent, this case does not apply. Um, but if it's non-presidential and it's in our favor, we're certainly arguing strong that it should be, and um, that, that it should be what they look to when they're making their decision. But because um, I know, you know, that's what we do. And, and um, you know, that's just kind of how we, we articulate and argue and, and, and represent our clients. Um, you know, and, and Mo, I, I think it's important for, um, for people to realize that this is really analyzing cases and then kind of figuring out where what the, the, the case that we're dealing with fits in is a real core legal skill, right? And that's a lot like, that's what we spend a lot of time learning about how to do in law school. And we spend a lot of time doing it because, um, you know, writing laws is hard and life is complicated. And so it's not, um, you know, a lot of legal work. You would think that, oh, okay, well, you come in and you present me with a situation and I, I go to my bookcase of 800 books and I pull out the right book and the answer is right there and I tell you the answer. Um, really, a lot of the times is, you know, there's, one of my favorite examples is, and, and this is like a common law school typo, is you know, there's a, a law that says no vehicles in park, right? And so someone drives their car into the park and they get a ticket. Well, obviously, right? The car is a vehicle and you can't have it in the park. Well, then someone rides their bike into the park and they get a ticket. Well, is a bike a vehicle? Um, you know, let's, let's say no. Well, then someone drives their motorized wheelchair into the, into the park and gets a ticket. Uh, well, shoot, should they have gotten a ticket? I mean, a, you know, a wheelchair is kind of like a bike, you know, where we use it for personal transportation. It's not allowed on the road. It's not as dangerous as a car. But then it's also kind of like a car. It has a motor and it zooms around in that way that, mm -hmm. you know, who knows? Well, then someone flies a, a drone into a park and gets a ticket. No vehicles in park. Is that in the park? Is it more like a car? Or is it more like a bike or a wheelchair? And, and so these are the kinds of... Um, these are the kinds of problems that every lawyers run into in every case. And to answer those questions, we would go and look at, you know, what does the law say? What is the language of the law say? The people who passed the law, what were they thinking about when they did it? Like, you know, what was the debate about? 
Um, if any agencies interpret the law, then what do those agencies think of the law? And then we'd look at court decisions and say, what have other courts decided about this law? Maybe there's a similar law, you know, we're here in Georgia. Well, maybe in Alabama, there's a similar law and there's no court cases here, but we could see what Alabama courts have done. And we can say, hey, we should be like Alabama. Maybe my opponent would say, things are different here in Georgia for reasons and we should have a different law here. You know, maybe our vehicles here are safer than the vehicles in, in Alabama, I don't know. And, and so that's the kind of legal analysis that um, appellate lawyers are really, do, all lawyers, but especially in, in these appellate matters, like that's, that's kind of the, um, the day in day out work that you're doing in, in, in every appellate court and writing your briefs and that kind of stuff. That, that's a super big issue here, right? When we're talking about uh, appointing a, a, a new U.S. Supreme Court justice, which with going back into the point of you were talking about what was thought about when the law was created, right? So when we're talking about the Constitution and when the Constitution was written hundreds of years ago, you know, how does this justice view the Constitution? Are they looking at it from an originalist viewpoint of, of the way it was drafted? Uh, you know, and there's a million issues, hot button issues that we could bring up and talk about with regard to that, whether, you know, marriage or abortion and, you know, you start there and go, go on for hours. And, and it, were those contemplated or is the document of living and breathing document? So that's from an appellate standpoint, that's a huge issue when you're talking about constitutional issues. And, and even when you boil down to more, you know, straight things that aren't that, you know, controversial, when you talk about election laws, how do you, how are elections done, you know? We're talking about ballots and how we can do curbside voting or, or doing certain things that maybe electronic ballots. Maybe why can't we do that? We're doing Zoom court now and we're having Zoom trials. Why can't we vote by Zoom, right? Or do some kind of electric ballot. So the, I mean, these things are things that may not have been, certainly were not contemplated when the constitution was written. So, you know, interpreting those and, and figuring that out is certainly something that appellate lawyers and judges and justices on, on appellate courts are gonna have to be, be dealing with. And those are tough issues. Um, I, I, don't, I want to be mindful of your time. I, um, I guess, you know, I, I've got a fun question for you here to wrap up. Would you want to be a judge? Would you, have you ever, have you guys ever thought about being a judge? Alicia, you, um, any, 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 any inclination to ever be a judge? Judge, not, judge Kinslow? No, no, no. <laughs> I, I really don't want to be a judge. I enjoy reading opinions. I mean, even like preparing for this, I had an opportunity to read through some of the opinions that are coming, um, arguments are gonna be heard soon. I really enjoy that. I enjoy the work of just, just arguing my cases for my clients, finding the nuances in the law, looking at how I think the law needs to change, finding that right case and trying to promote that. I enjoy that side of it. Um, I would not like to sit in a confirmation here. <laughs> that, would not, that does not look to be pleasant to me at all. So I, I definitely have no interest in being a judge, but I do greatly respect the work that goes into it. Um, yeah. I do think it's an extremely important thing. Federal appointments are one thing, but I would definitely, you know, encourage people to understand who they're electing to their local courts. I think that's a, a thing that we're not paying a lot of attention to when we yeah. talk about voting and elections. People really should pay attention to who they're electing to courts because those are the gatekeepers, those trial courts that you're going to when you have something going on in your life. Those are the ones you really kind of need to make sure you understand um, what, you know, what their positions are before you elect them. Ab absolutely. That's an awesome point. And if you don't know, and you're not, you don't feel like, you know, reach out to some lawyers in your community that you trust. If, if, if you're not sure about who, who may be the best for your, you know, for you and your issues, reach out to some lawyers that you respect or people in the legal community in your area and talk to them about, Hey, what is this person like? Have, have you been in court with them? What are you hearing on the grapevine about them? So you kind of have a better idea, you know, what you think might be best for you and your family and, and your worldviews. Um, Ryan, what do you think? Judge, hey, Judge Locke, uh, maybe TV. I, I think, you know what? I think I see him, Alicia. I don't think I see him as a real judge. I th I'm seeing TV, uh, you know, WGN judge, television judge. That's correct. That's correct. See, I, I want I want to be on Judge Wapner from from two from two thirty to five is when I want. And, hey, uh, if we can make Judge Judy money, man, we, we are we are set right. You know, um, no, I, I I agree with Alicia. I think um, you know we all know a lot of judges, and I think it's a really difficult job. And you know the mm -hmm. I think the the highest compliment you can have for a judge is if if you go in you present your argument to a judge and you lose, but you say, you know what? That judge paid attention to what I had to say. 
that judge thought hard about my argument and, and decided against me, but I feel like the process was fair. And, you know, and, and, and this, this is, this is justice, even if I don't agree with it. Um, the, and, and I think that's, that's just so hard to do day in and day out. Um, I, I'd hope that, you know, if, if, if I'm, if, if, if I'm ever picked to be a judge, I'd hope that I'd be able to do that. But, but I know that it's, it's a difficult thing to do. No doubt, but, but it, it, it's a good feeling because we all know judges that when you walk into their court, you know, sometimes unfortunate and some of it's legitimate because they're so busy, they're overwhelmed, they're understaffed, they don't have time to read things before, before or arguments. But we've got other judges, you know, when you walk in, they're gonna cut right to the chase because they've read every scrap of paper that's been submitted to them and they just start in with questions. Talk to me about why this is this way, Mr. Lilienthal, because I don't see it that way. And, you know, and he, he or she's going to give me an opportunity to, to address that. And like you said, I respect that. I mean, I still may not agree with their decision, but, but I respect it as long as, as long as they give my client a fair shake at it and an opportunity to do. And, and I think we've seen that on the Supreme Court. I think you've seen such, an, for example, Justice Roberts, many people thought he may have been one way with certain issues and he, he's voted with the, the more moderate or, or liberal rock on other issues. And I'm not one way or the other with Justice Roberts, just giving that as an example, but people sitting back and, and viewing things in, in, in a vacuum with that issue. And, and, and I'm going to sit here and listen to what the law is and listen to what the arguments are and try to make the right decision, regardless of what my personal beliefs may be. Ron, you were yeah, going to say something? Oh, no, no. I think that's an excellent point where I think that there's, th there are a lot of, of judicial, um, judicial ideas that, that do not neatly fall into one political party or the other. And so I think, um, you know, if, if I have anything to say about uh, uh, the, the current confirmation hearing is that I think it's too reductive to say, well, I think we should, we should, we shouldn't put any conservative people, politically conservative people. I want a, a politically liberal judge um, on the Supreme court. And I think that, you know, you really have to look at kind of what they think ab about, you know, what their judicial philosophy is kind of what they've been thinking about various different aspects. And, you know, I mean, as, as we see in, in, in five, four cases, time and time again, you know, their interesting facts can create, you know, interesting majorities. Mm -hmm. And, and so, it, you know, I don't think you can just say, all right, well, someone's going to be conservative. So they're going to be, they're going to vote that, yeah, they're going to judge this way all the time. I agree with that. I agree with that. Absolutely. Anything else, any parting words, Alicia? Yeah, right. yeah, so I would encourage people to check out SCOTUS blog, which is the Supreme Court of the United States blog. It gives a little synopsis on all the cases. There's some interesting ones that are coming out. There was a recent brief um, or petition filed by uh, Trump um, that is there. So people can take a look at that. It's an interesting read. You know, and I think a lay person would think it's interesting the way that it's written. So if you are curious, just kind of what's coming up, just, you know, follow the blog and it'll just give you a little short synopsis of the cases that are going up. And I think the more that people become aware of what's going on and the types of cases that are going before the court and the type of decisions that are being made, the more we can make informed decisions at the levels that we can really affect change. 100%. I think, I think that's spot on and just being informed. I mean, in doing, and I think you can do it at, at, at a more of a, a macro level, but still be informed on certain things. And that, as you said, that trickles down to more of a local level that may impact you on a more day in day out basis. Ron, any closing, closing arguments, counselor? I, I had, um, there's only one piece of trivia that I told you I had to say, and it's that the, the, um, uh, most recent justice is in charge of the cafeteria committee and um, the the biggest recent change has been Justice Kagan put in a frozen yogurt machine in the Supreme Court cafeteria, Supreme Court of the United States cafeteria. That's your piece of trivia. But yeah, you know, I think I agree with with everything you all have said. I think, um, you know, the we can't overlook state courts. Um, at least here in Georgia, we have an extremely open state Supreme Court and state court of appeals. They, they broadcast every oral argument online and they record it so you can watch it later. And I think that's a, that's a really interesting view of how things are happening in, the, in your state. And then I, I want to echo y'all's comments about the, the importance of your local judges. Here in Georgia, judges are elected and, you know, that judge you know, if, if you interact with any judge, 
that judge is probably going to be the biggest force on your life. If you get into a car wreck, if you need a divorce, if you get charged with a crime, um, if, if, you know, if you're in a, if, if you're in a business contract and the other party breaches and you got to sue them, um, you know, there's really whole swaths of your life where that's the judge you're going to go to if you need something from the justice system. And so those judicial elections are incredibly important. Every lawyer, you know, here, every lawyer has lots to say about who should be voted in and, and not. And so if, if you're interested in that, find a lawyer, you know, ask them their thoughts, read up on the candidates. Um, I think local judicial elections are, just, even though we're talking about the, the highest court in the land here, um, you know, you know, lo your, your local judges are, are, um, are also very important. Absolutely. And, and I think the local judges, you know, if you're to kind of go to kind of come full circle here at the end is that is, 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 well, certainly rulings on constitutional issues could affect us all. But, but if you've got a, if you've got a legal matter, a personal legal matter, the odds are you're never seeing the U S Supreme court, it's going to be your <laughs> right. local judge. It's going to be your local right. judge. So staying involved in knowing local issues and, and being uh, active and proactive with being aware of who maybe best supports your, your issues when you're looking voting for local judges is, is, is paramount. So Alicia, Ryan, thank you so much for taking time today and, and jumping on with us to kind of talk a little uh, U.S. Supreme Court roundtable here and, and judges in general and federal court jurisdiction. I really appreciate it. Um, folks, thank you for tuning in. If you've got questions, um, we'll monitor the, the comments afterwards. We'll put it in there. And what I'll do too is I'll jump on and put the uh, both uh, resources that Ryan and Alicia mentioned in the comments for everybody to check out if y'all wanna follow those things. Thanks everybody.